Please follow along as we work our way through the text. We're just going to continue to worship underneath God's word. G.K. Chesterton said that thanks is the highest form of thought. Thanks is the highest form of thought. I really appreciate that. He writes, just, just continue there. He writes, I do not in my private capacity believe that a baby gets its best physical food by sucking his thumb. Nor do I think that a man gets his best physical food by sucking his soul and denying its dependence on God and other good things. I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I really appreciate that because Chesterton is saying that we don't, we're not serving ourselves or anyone best by what others would call navel-gazing. So much introspection. No, it is better to see out and look through the lens of God's Word onto what God is doing and what God is actively at work around us and the things He provides for us. And let that move on us an attitude or a state of mind that is in thanksgiving. Moving from anxiety and fear and concern to thanksgiving. Thanks is, thanks are the highest form of thought. And gratitude or thanksgiving is basically happiness doubled by wonder. So that is absolutely relevant for the passage Mike read for us. Once again, in chapter 2, verse 13, Paul resumes where he was in chapter 1 with reasons for him giving thanks to God. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. For we also thank God constantly for this. And what is he thanking God constantly for? He's thanking God for the Thessalonian believers and how they received the word. Simple things that we may be tempted to take for granted, Paul the Apostle is able to look at through the eyes of God's gracious activity in the lives of people and say, this is another reason for thanks to God. And I just want to encourage you that there are so many things that God does around us um, and reveals to us in His Word, that if we would see our lives through the lens of His Word, we would have more capacity to lean into this state of mind or this form of thought that is thanksgiving. That, that the happiness that is brought about when we see things happening, good things happening, that that can be doubled by awe and wonder when we realize that that good thing that happened isn't just happenstance. It didn't happen by accident or merely by our own power. It happened by God's hand. And so wonder can be mixed in with happiness. And when, when happiness is doubled by wonder, that explodes in gratitude. Our passage, only four verses long, very, very simple. As we look at it, a few things, a few characteristics stand up and out of this passage for us to hold on to, for our hope and for our joy. And I just want to point some of them out to you um, this morning. Number one, when we look at this passage, we see that there is a thanksgivingness that comes up out of the passage for the Word of God. And most notably, I would say to us that we should be a people, or let us be a people as a church family, who thank God whenever the Word is accepted for what it is. I'll say it again. Let us thank God whenever the Word is accepted for what it is. Look at verse 13. We also thank God constantly for this. And what is this? 
that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it for what it, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. There are so many components of the word that I would want to point out from this, from that one verse alone. There is so much, there's an ocean of good theology wrapped up in verse 13. But for the sake of time, let me just highlight a few things for you. When I say to us that let us give thanks to God whenever the word is accepted for what it is, Paul unpacks that. And it's, it may seem so um, plain and genuine uh, or obvious that it doesn't need to be uh, unpacked to any, but I think we have a tendency to miss the obvious and the wonder of the obvious. Notice with me, number one, verse 13 says that God speaks, that God has spoken and he has given to us his own word. God is able to communicate clearly and effectively, and God speaks. He is not silent. He's communicative. He does not stand off in a corner. He is up front and gets involved and is personal and is engaging, and God speaks. He spoke in the Old Testament through Moses. He spoke in the New Testament, most especially through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the Word of God in John chapter 1. And then Paul and the Lord Jesus in his teaching helps us to understand, and Peter does also, that the entirety of the Scriptures is the Word of God for us. So God speaks in specific times, specific ways, to specific people like the Old Testament. And every, all the writings, all the, all the written Scripture is God's Word to us, God speaking to us. And at the same time, the Lord Jesus himself is the manifestation of God as the word of God. And then maybe two more things that are highlighted, I think, in this text that we have a tendency to underappreciate. Number one, the gospel is also the word of God. When Paul brought God's word to the people in Thessalonica, He brought to them the gospel, the arrival and saving activity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he brought it to them as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So not just the person of the Lord Jesus being the word, but his life and saving activity and what it means for sinners like you and I. That is also, according to Paul, the word of God. And then one that I tend to underappreciate Whenever the gospel is proclaimed, whenever the word is taught and proclaimed, this also is the word of God. Notice how the text is, notice how the text is, is written. He writes, you received that, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us. So absolutely, the word of God is written in this passage The word of God is heard and not just recited. Paul didn't just go in and recite from Isaiah chapter 53. He opened it up and explained it and pointed to the fact that this text is pointing to Jesus as the Messiah and Lord and Savior. So as we survey the book of Acts, Paul goes into synagogues, He opens the scriptures that are given to him for the day, and he helps people understand from the text the significance of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The proclamation of the gospel is also the word of God, the word which you heard from us. The word preached is also the word of God. And I'll say to you, that's kind of scary to me. And that's something I had to wrestle with with this text that I don't think I've wrestled with in as deep a form as I had preparing for this week, this time together. 
when the gospel is faithfully proclaimed, when God's word is faithfully preached, heralded, announced, that too is the word of God. Not in the same sense, nor with the same final authority as God's written word for us in our time, but still a manifestation of God's word nonetheless. So, the word of God written, the word of God in the person of Christ Jesus, the word of God in the work of Christ Jesus, the gospel, and the word of God proclaimed, announced, preached, heralded, that too is a manifestation or a bringing to, the, bringing to folks the word of God. And Paul says that he thanks God that they received it, that, that they received the word of God, which they heard from them, and they accepted it. And those two words, receiving and accepted, are, are two things that need to happen to make sure that the Word of God is effective in people's lives. It's not just merely spoken. It must also be received and accepted. So the the Word is heard and is either ignored or it is heeded, listened to, and then it is accepted. One One of those two terms is objective, the act of hearing or receiving the word, and the other is accepting, the other is subjective. I take this good news as applying to me. Yes, I hear you presenting, preaching, proclaiming from the word of God, and I put myself under its influence, and I take its way of thinking to become my way of thinking. And I take its truths and fold my life underneath it. And its word, what it has to say, I appropriate, I take unto myself. One is passive. I'm just hearing the word. The other is active. I accept it. I receive it. And I receive it as not merely the word of man, some guy's opinion, or somebody's interpretation. But I hear it as God speaking to me. I hear it as the word of God. The word of man should be evaluated and can easily be dismissed. The word of God should be surrendered to and walked in obedience to and indeed stand in, stood in awe of. Paul says, when I think about how you Thessalonians received God's word and accepted it not just as a, the word of man, but what it really is, the word of God, Paul says, I give thanks. That seemingly simple thing makes me happy. And because God is behind it, I stand in wonder. So his happiness is doubled by wonder and he is grateful to God. The common everyday things that we take for granted like the word of God in our laps on our devices, and spoken by someone who loves you is not to be underestimated, but is to be rejoiced in and is to be a cause for heartfelt gratitude to the living God. And Paul goes further. He looks back to their recent past. This church is only a few months old, less than a year old. It talks about when he brought the gospel to them and worked with them over time, preaching, proclaiming, teaching the word of God to them and how they received it and accepted it in, in due awe and wonder as not just merely the word of men, but the word of God. 
He moves from the past, though, and puts his little note at the end of verse 13 into the present. This Word of God is actively at work in you believers. That's an amazing phrase. It brings to mind, remember when we were in Mark not that long ago? Mark 4, Jesus tells the story or the parable of the sower. He's like the statue of the guy on top of the Capitol, downtown Lincoln, who's pulling out seed from his sack and just throwing it. And the sower indiscriminately casts seed all over the place. He's not a very great farmer. Not much preparation of soil. He's just, I'll throw it on this. I'll throw it in among the rocks. I'll throw it on the bricks. I'll take it to the beach and throw it on the sand. And I'll spread some on good ground. I mean, we would call that a waste of seed. But to illustrate or to demonstrate the point and the power of God at work in his word, Jesus says that when that seed of the word of God takes hold in someone's life, it bears fruit 60, 80, and 100 fold. It keeps on going and growing. It's an amazing thing. That means And especially when he says, in you believers. That means that there is a power at work behind the word of God that is still present, that is still active in the lives of believers after they believe. And that is our constant hope. I think it's one of the main reasons why we get together as a church family. Not only for fellowship, not only to rejoice in what God has done in his saving work through Christ Jesus, but to put ourselves once again underneath the waterfall of the word of God in prayer and in hope that it will continue to penetrate and have effect on us. So it's not just a past, pre- a past state of grace, but a present flow, a present current in our lives. That there is more and more transformation into the image of Christ Jesus at work in believers because of the Word of God. It is at work. And I just once again want to draw all of this back to where Paul started in verse 13. We also give thanks to God for this. When you find the Word is at work in your life, that is a reason for rejoicing. Don't take that as common. Wherever you find the Word of God at work, let it be a reason for thanksgiving. Whenever you find yourself brought back from the cliff or the precipice the suicidal trajectory of temptation. Whenever you find yourself brought back from that by a word from God that you remember or someone speaks to you in a timely moment, let that be a cause for rejoicing. I'll say more about that as we, as, towards the end of our time together. Paul says, I thank God constantly that you had this kind of interaction with the Word of God. And I say, just based on our just fly over look at verse 13, I say, let us thank God whenever the Word is accepted for what it is. The Word of God, not merely someone's opinion or the writings of men. Whenever people stand in awe and bow the knee to God because of what they hear in His Word, Let us be thankful. Let us be thankful. Second, let us give thanks to God wherever his word is at work. And that's what I was just pointing out to you in verse 13. That not only is there a past component, there's a present one. And God's word is at work in believers. And the you there at work in you believers, that's plural, which you would expect because believers is plural. 
But once again, Paul is leaning into not just the individuals, but the gathering. The assembly of the Thessalonian believers, the group of them, and God's word is at work in their lives, and it is a cause for giving thanks. God's powerful word is understood as his, and not merely the creation of men. God used men. God used many men over many, many years to produce one word from him. And at the same time, not only is it in the past, but it's in the present, God's word is at work in the lives of believers today. It is our hope. Third, let us give thanks to God as the word makes us imitators of faithful, suffering saints. Whenever the word makes us imitators of faithful, suffering saints. Look at verse 14. Paul writes, For you became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, because you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Now, that last little bit right there leads us into my, my final point. So I'm just going to stay for just a second. But I just want you to see that there is a, a pattern of suffering that, has, that, has, that is woven through the text. And the, the church in Thessalonica picked up on it and they walked the same path. He says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches or the, the assemblies, the, the, the groupings together of the people of God that are in Christ Jesus, that are in Judea, because you suffered the same things. So, apparently, Judea, the place where Jerusalem is, Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth, so this, this region where the Lord's where the Lord served, uh, the Lord Jesus lived, served, suffered, rose. The believers who are there experienced a form of suffering from their countrymen. This is not an ethnic thing. This is a, this is a place thing, a regional thing. From their own countrymen, the people, their fellow citizens of that area. They suffered because of the gospel, because of the word of God that they received as the word of God. They suffered, and then far away in Thessalonica, these believers that we're reading about here, they also suffered from the hands of their countrymen, fellow Thessalonians. And Paul says, I give thanks to God not only because the word is at work, but the activity of the word made you into imitators of faithful believers. The activity of the word of God in the life of believers made you imitators of them. Made you walk the way they did. Made you do the same things they did when they faced suffering. Now, I think I've told you before that imitation is almost second nature. We almost can't help but imitate people around us. Especially those that we admire and look up to. Even if that's a mainly subconscious thing. We pick up on the way they walk. We pick up on their way of speech and mannerisms. Imitation happens not only in childhood, but very much into adult life as well. And Paul says, Paul is indicating here that the Thessalonian believers have picked up on a pattern of faithfulness that they got from Paul, who got it from the Lord Jesus, but was also echoed widely into a group of people that they've never met other believers who are in Judea, far away from them. There's this 
pattern of faithfulness to God even in the midst of suffering and unfair treatment. And Paul says, whether you knew it or not before, I want you to know that you are following or become imitators of another group of believers, those that are in Judea. So this this pattern, this this work of following after and, and, um, and imitating, especially not merely the way people talk, but holding fast to God even in the midst of suffering, that is a very, not only Christ-like thing to do, it's a very church-like thing to do. Like that's the pattern. And it's my understanding that the word for at the beginning of verse 14 connects it to that the reason why Paul is giving thanks in verse 13, that this word of God is at work in their lives. They receive it as the word of God, it is currently at work, and so therefore, it enables them, encourages them, keeps them holding on to God, even when they're mistreated by people around them. I see it as an activity of the Word of God. The Word, which is at work in you believers, helps them to become imitators of faithful churches who are faithful even amid suffering. So I think, just keeping in line with Paul here, I say, if that's a reason to give thanks to God, and again, it's just tied right back up to verse 13. If that's a reason for Paul to give thanks to God, I say, let us be a people too who rejoice and overflow with thanksgiving to God whenever and however the Word of God makes believers imitators of faithful, suffering saints. Now, I would have had to say, in our recent history, a few decades ago, let's dig back through history of believers, their biographies, and how they endured and held on to God through different things that they experienced, believers in other generations. Or I would click and say, let's spin the globe and point our finger to spots around the globe, and let's look at the lives of other believers and hear reports from them, of how they're holding on to faith in God, though, through their, though they experience suffering at the hands of their own countrymen. But I think today, like September 2020, this text for us is not merely a cause to look back and give thanks to God. It could also be a call to prepare and look forward and be ready to give thanks to God. Because thoughtful believers are watching in North America certain freedom, certain things that are becoming harder for us to do, especially sharing the gospel and living lives in accordance with God's word. And yes, nothing that is being experienced right now is very harsh forms of suffering at the hands of our countrymen. If the trajectory of the last several years is to hold into the future, it could be. So rather than cower in fear and complain and whine, let us look at the trajectory of faithful saints from the very beginning who have stared suffering because of the gospel in the face and said, let's go. Now, just to be clear, I'm not somebody who wishes or delights in suffering. I don't think it makes us like better believers, like in the sense of we get a gold star. But I do think God uses it to advance the church and deepen the word in the lives of his people. And so, wherever around the globe and throughout history and in preparation, for what may be coming for us. Instead of fear and cowering and hiding, let us continue to walk boldly in God's grace under the waterfall of his word, and let us pray that it has 
the effect in our lives of at, being at work in us and keeping us faithful amidst whatever sufferings may come. Let this be a word of hope for you, not a reason for retreat. If, and I, I tie it all back to God in verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this. This word that is at work in the lives of believers helps them to become imitators of faithful churches amidst suffering throughout time. And I say to you, let that be a path forward for us, that the scriptures that we, we, we can tend to take for granted, the scriptures read, meditated on, and proclaimed, and shared, and encouraged by, God can use that as a pathway to strengthen our backs for whatever may come our way. I say to you, does that not echo what Paul said last week? We had boldness in our God to share the gospel with you amidst much suffering. That's how Paul talks about the past, this boldness. And I think this is a pathway for us in the coming years. Either way, God has been at work through his word, strengthening believers to be imitators of faithful suffering saints. And we can draw strength and encouragement from Christian biography, which I think is something we should read. And by looking at God's faithful work in the lives of suffering saints around the globe, and in history. And I think since God is worthy of that kind of thanksgiving, it would do our souls good and bring Him glory for us to learn or refresh our memories from the good works of God in the lives of people who have gone on before us and return thanks to God for His work in their lives. And then finally, I said that we should thank God whenever the Word is accepted for what it is, the Word of God that we should thank God whenever his word is at work in the lives of believers. I said that we should thank God whenever the word makes us imitators of faithful, suffering saints. And then lastly, let's be a people who thank God as his word spreads even in the face of opposition. Look at verse 15 and 16. Whenever God's word spreads even in the face of opposition, let us be a people who give thanks to God. He does it all the time. In verse 15, Paul picks up on the concept that he leaves off at the end of verse 14, which he says, as the Judean Christians suffered at the hands of their countrymen, the Jews, Paul picks up on that and starts to talk about the Jews, the unbelieving Jews. Now, let me just say up front, when Mike read those two verses, if part of you cringed, you're not alone. Are these verses a clue that maybe Hitler was right about some things? Is this a reason for anti-Semitism being against Jews? How they did all these things and hindered in all these ways and wrath has come upon them at last. I think you and I both know that that's wrong. That's not the case. And, and just, just to unpack that a bit in case you're bothered by it, let me just get the, let me get the thorn in the back of your brain plucked out so that you can move forward with a sense of peace through the text. Paul himself is a Jew. And Paul goes into every town, every city, first looking for Jewish people to bring them the gospel and try to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. His tagline throughout Romans 
over and over is to the Jew first and then the rest of the nations. To the Jew first and then the rest of the nations. So whatever we understand the New Testament to be teaching about the current state of the Jewish people, one thing is clear. By example, Paul made them a priority. Because they need the gospel just like anybody else. Paul made them a priority. And number two, whatever he faced at their hands, did not lead him to any kind of retribution, but caused him to trust God to do whatever he thought was right. Now, with that out of the way, that there is no anti-Semitism in the text at all, let us lean into what the text does have to say. The unbelieving Jews in Paul's time became a blockade, a roadblock, a hurdle, a broken bridge, preventing word getting out about the risen Christ. And their opposition to the good news took many forms. Look at verse 15. Not all Jews but these unbelieving Jews, especially these unbelieving Jews who are active in this way, verse 15 says, they, they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. And they drove us out. And they displeased God. And they oppose all mankind by hindering the gospel proclamation. It's an amazing thing. That is an amazing thing. Jesus talks about how the Jews of his day were responsible for the sins that their forefathers committed against prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah. Jeremiah was captured, incarcerated, strongly mistreated, thrown in a pit. Isaiah eventually was captured and, tradition has it, was uh, drawn in quartered, so four horses, each tied to a limb, heading in different directions, and sawn in two. They so despised God's word of judgment and coming redemption that they killed the prophets. And it is one of the reasons why the Lord Jesus, when, when he served in his life here, took on not only the mantle of king and lord and master and savior, but also prophet. They weren't wrong when they called him a prophet, a teacher the teacher of Israel. And he voluntarily surrendered himself into their murderous hands. He did it on purpose. And though God was active and planned and involved in his hand all over all of that, we hear about that in the opening chapters of Acts, Paul says here, the human side of that equation is the hint they, they killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets. Trying to hold back this message of judgment and redemption through Jesus Christ, trying to hinder and hold back that message, they killed the Lord and the prophets. And then Paul says, and they drove us out. Again, if you just survey the middle chapters of Acts, you see that from town to town, place to place, Paul goes into the Jewish synagogue proclaiming the good news, and he's being driven out of cities, oftentimes stoned and left for dead. He's being pushed out. And I found this little comment about God's displeasure just tucked right in there to be most telling. 
Because last week, we saw that earlier in chapter 2, when Paul speaks with integrity and proclaims with integrity and boldness the Word of God, he is striving not merely to appease people, but to please God. Paul is saying here in the same context, the next paragraph over, he's saying that in their hindering of the messengers, the Lord Jesus, the prophets, the apostles, by hindering the messengers who would speak this good word, they are not at all pleasing to God, even though the Lord made it very clear that they thought that they were doing exactly that. They thought that they were serving God in what they were doing. But Paul goes out, switches viewpoint from how they hindered the messengers to how they are hindering the effects of the message. They are actually in opposition to all mankind, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And they are this way because they over and over attempt to hinder Paul and his traveling companions from speaking to the Gentiles, that they may be saved. Then he writes, so always to fill up the measure of their sins. And I stand in awe and wonder that when you have an entire nation of leaders and activists against you and your three traveling companions, using whatever means available to them, twisting your words, stirring up a riot, throwing you in prison, by whatever human means possible, every attempt is being made to hinder this word going out. And I stand in awe and wonder that the word still got out. That Paul was freed from prison. Paul continued his journey onto Thessalonica. That the word was heard and received as not the word of man, but the word of God. That for all the attempts at hindering, the word still got through. And I say to you, that's a reason for thanksgiving. I give thanks to God that even in this, when all mankind or all those who are in the know make every effort to hinder the word, it's still going Fourth, give thanks to God. Paul is still active, although every attempt was made to hinder. And then I was also stuck by just how Paul tucks huge chunks of reality into little phrases in lengthy verses, like run-on sentences. And he says, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles or to the nations that they may be saved. Like, there is no eternal salvation unless people hear the message that must be said. Not only good deeds done in the Lord's name, but the message of the gospel clearly communicated. That has to happen or else people don't get saved. They remain under the right wrath of God. That is a huge word for us. And so let us be a people who understand that we are commissioned, tasked, entrusted with the gospel and that people need to hear it in order to be saved. God has sovereignly put you and I in the circles of networks of people that we know and enjoy. God has put you in that circle on purpose. He didn't put me there. He put you there. And let us prayerfully Walk with the Lord, asking him to open doors and opportunities and grant to us the courage and clarity to communicate the message that could save people from the wrath of God that they deserve.
if opposition gets worse. I think we will look back on these days and kind of kick ourselves a little bit. Why wasn't I more vocal when things were easier? I'm just saying. If you're like me, do you know what it is to regret and to lie awake at night with regrets? As hard as you strive to give them to the Lord, they bounce around in your brain. And I think if things get worse, opposition-wise, we will look back on these relatively easier days and go, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? News this great? A God this glorious? A power so faithful to have a historical timeline of Christians who he's preserved amidst opposition? What, what was I thinking? Who was I trying to please? So I, I say to you, thanks be to God, the word going forward amidst opposition. And I, I, the, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, give me a bit, a little bit of that last line there. I don't, um, I'm not yet at a place where I'm, where I'm completely comfortable trying to explain to you what wrath has come upon them at the last time. That phrase translated in the ESV, wrath has come upon them at last, with an exclamation point, can also be translated, wrath has come upon them, or will come upon them at the last, or in the last time, like when the Lord returns. So it could be talking about what happened at the, to the Jews in those early days, or it could be talking about something that's going to happen when the Lord returns, and more than likely, both those truths are woven into that phrase. And I just would say to you, God knows what he's doing, and whatever he does is right and good. And that is also a word for us. Let me explain what I mean. As we've worked our way through these four verses, I think there are at least three ways that we can respond. Number one, let us cling to God's word as the word of God and to prayer. And I realize that that is like an easy and fairly obvious application to make from the text, but just once again, just appreciate with a, a dramatic and profound sense that what we have available to us is the very words of the living God. And that He has made promises to His people, calling from us trust in Him. And so I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God find their yes in Him, in the Lord Jesus. That is why through Him we utter to God our amen to His glory. So all the promises of the Old Testament find their yes in Jesus for the people of God, and I present it to you so that by whatever means necessary, you're able to hold on and call to mind and act in and trust in God's word in the hour of testing. I think of this because the word is still at work in you believers. It is very much the general hope of the gospel, very, very much. But... It can also be specific. John Piper came up with this uh, little acronym called APTAT. It, the, APTAT isn't even a word, but A P T A T. A P T A T. And he says when you get into situations that require you. To move forward by faith, he says, number one, admit. Admit to God and to yourself, I can't do this. I can't do this without you. I need your help. Admit. Admit your weakness. Admit your dependence. I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I can't go forward. I can't do the thing that I'm supposed to do. Say this hard word to this person that I love. 
Admit to God your fears, concerns, your weaknesses. Admit. Number two, pray. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. It could be as simple as, God, help me. Admit, pray. And here's our connection to the text. Trust. The word is at work in you who believe. You believers. So trust. Trust God to be faithful to his purposes for you in a general sense. Trust him to never leave you or forsake you in a general sense. Fine. But wherever and however possible, grow in your familiarity with his word so that you can call to mind and trust God for specific things in his word. The things that are through Christ Jesus find their yes, so blood brought promises to us. We trust him for his word. And then once you have once you've determined to trust God in light of his word to you, you act. A P T A. Act. You do the thing you that you had a hard time doing. You say that hard word. You, you initiate the hard conversation. You do that hard thing. You act. And then you give thanks. And I'll tell you, that last one comes almost, almost automatically. I confided in some of you that I have such a fear of public speaking that I tremble every Sunday. I hide in that corner, so next Sunday you can... You cannot sing and kind of look over there and watch me hiding in that corner. And I've got a desperate fear of doing this every Sunday. Like to the point where my knees buckle and I literally squat down. I have a phobia of my phone. It's not that I don't like talking to people on the phone. I'm afraid of it. But I know that in faithfulness to God and for his glory, some things have to happen. A sermon needs to be preached, and a phone call needs to be made. And I will tell you that nine times out of ten, I make my way back to that little room like an hour later and collapse in my chair rejoicing. Whether it was a boring sermon or a powerful one, I rejoice. God has shown himself faithful again. And when I hang up the phone with some of you and the conversation was hard and I, and I hope we were understood, I hope it was clear back and forth, I still rejoice. What was needed to be said was said and there's every reason to trust that God is working on the other side of that line when I'm done. I applied it to me, let me apply it to you. When you are afraid, when you are afraid, and so I don't expect you to be taking notes, but if you're jotting out your phone, jotting notes on your phone or whatever, take down Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. A specific word for times of fear, a word from God's word. Isaiah 41, verse 10 says, fear not for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Admit you're afraid. Pray for courage and boldness. Cling to the promise. Rehearse it to yourself. Fear not, I am with you, says the Lord. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand and act. When you are afraid, but how about when you want X? The de- and when the desire for that thing or that person or that situation becomes so strong, it clouds out your view of God's glory. When the desire for 
X becomes so strong. When you covet or want, remember Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Keep yourself or keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You have me. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. A command do to me. When your desire for things wells up, fight it with faith in God's word that we have him. And we can say it confidently. And this is a fight against the love of money. Next, when you are growing bitter, when the anger about what somebody has done to you is taking hold, and as much as you try, you can't shake it, you can't distract yourself from it, you can't Netflix it out, like you can't binge watch something, you can't drown yourself in your headphone and get rid of it, like the bitterness is taking hold every time you come up for air, just remember the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Behold, or beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. That's why I told you I'd come back to God's wrath. Loved ones, don't bring about your own vengeance. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Every wrong will be made right, will receive justice at the hands of the judge of the universe who knows all things and does all things right. And every wrong by someone who persists in unbelief will be mediated out by God in hell, which is a better and more just vengeance that you could bring out than what you could bring out. Or if that person is a believer that it has been fully poured out on the Son of God, and wrath has been fully poured out. So God does it better, and God does it rightly. And God encourages us with a title of beloved. Loved ones, you who I love, don't avenge yourselves. Don't go down that path. Leave it to me, says the God who loves you. So when you're afraid, Isaiah 41, when you want, as Hebrews 13, and when you're growing bitter, Romans chapter 12. And I say, may God so work through his word in our lives that when faced with suffering or looking on his works, may they lead us to gratitude. Would you stand and let me pray for you? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for showing us the activity of your word and giving to us a reason to rejoice. And we know and understand and appreciate what you've been doing in the lives of saints that have gone on before us. And Heavenly Father, I ask that this would be our food and our fuel for the road ahead. I pray that this gathering of saints in this hour would have the wherewithal to cling to you and to trust you and to walk forward in proclaiming your word and sharing the good news with those who need to hear it. I pray that you'd strengthen the believers in this room through the ministry of your word and may it bear fruit in their lives. And I ask that truly we'd be able to look back and proclaim your greatness in all that you bring about. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave, would you lead us before we leave?
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.